carefully at this time. You're being handed out a, a map. We continue to update the map since our Joshua study where we talked about the promised land. And now in the time of the judges. You'll notice in the Transjordan tribes in East Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben, you'll find the cities that we talked about last week in our study of Jephthah. You'll see in Gad, we'll see Mizpah, where Jephthah takes the oath. We see Gilead, where he was raised, and Tob, where he fled to, and where the elders of Gilead got him. Today, we're going to be studying out uh, a lot of the towns that are in Dan and in Judah. And, of course, you see Zorah, Timnah, and, of course, some of the Philistine settlements of Gaza, Ascalon, and, of course, Gath. And prayerfully, this will be helpful to you as we begin our study. Today we're going to be studying chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 in the book of Judges. So we've got our work cut on out here today. And um, the title of the lesson is Samson's Strength. Samson's Strength. We're going to be studying about Samson. If you've been with us for our series, you know that if we were to sum up the time of the Judges, which begins after the death of Joshua, it had to be summed up in Judges chapter 21, verse 25, the very last scripture in the book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And of course, the whole issue was God was not king in Israel. And so everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Let's turn to Judges chapter 13. Beginning in verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's how it kind of always starts out, right guys? So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are sterile and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean, because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head, because the boy is to be a Nazarite, set apart to God from birth, and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. You know, right here, the Bible says that the angel of God told Samson's mom-to-be that her son would begin the deliverance of the Israelites from the hand of the Philistines. Well, this means that if he was to begin it, you'd have to say at the end of that 40-year period would be the time that he began his judgeship. So most likely, Samson's born right in the middle of this 40-year period, in the midst of this terribly depressing Situation. Now, very interestingly, and for those that have not been with us, the word Israel is used very loosely in the book of Judges. Israel can mean two tribes or it can mean three tribes on the east side of Jordan. It's just a very loose connotation of what it meant to be Israel. So Samson was a judge in Israel. But the tribes had become so autonomous by this time that very often there was more than one judge that was judging at that particular time. As a matter of fact, when you start putting all the scriptures together, you will find that at the same time that Samson is a judge in Israel, so is Eli a judge in Ephraim. And you remember, of course, the whole story about the birth of Samuel. And of course, if we go back, we'll find some of the very words spoken about that same time. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 3. In verse 1, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, and there were not many visions. There were not many dreams. The word of the Lord was rare. Well, that's the same period of time that we're talking about here with Samson. Now, interestingly, we find then that the judge that really succeeds Samson is Samuel himself. And so at the very time that Samson dies, Eli dies. And, of course, this is a terrible time because it's a time that the ark of God is literally taken out of the hands of the Israelites and sent in to the Philistines. And, of course, Eli's grandson was named Ichabod, which simply means the glory has departed from Israel. But, of course, we understand that Samson was just beginning the deliverance. So who brought it to completion? 
It was Samuel himself. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 7. In verse 2 it says, It was a long time, 20 years in all, that the ark remained in Kiriath Jerem. And all the people of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. And Samuel said to the whole house of Israel, If you're returning to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the asterisks and give it yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their bales and asked us, and serve the Lord only. Isn't it interesting right here that the Holy Spirit chooses the word the whole house of Israel? Because up until this time, there was a judge in the Danites. That was Samson. There was a judge in Ephraim. That was Eli. But now here's Samson. The anointed of God comes forth and he unites all the tribes. And later on it talks about how he subdued the Philistines. Amen? Well, in order to understand all of that, then we need to be understanding what also is taking place at this time. See, God was not only working in Dan with Samson, not only working in Ephraim with Eli, raising up Samuel to be the prophet that would lead his people to victory, but even in a little town called Bethlehem, the Holy Spirit was stirring Because at this time, most likely, Boaz and Ruth were celebrating the birth of their grandson, Jesse, who would become the father of King David. And so we start to see that God is orchestrating the lives, that God is orchestrating the tribes, that God is orchestrating the nations for the salvation of his people. And he brings it to this great crescendo under the judgeship of Samuel. Yes, a man, but always takes God's man to lead God's movement. Are you with me right here, guys? Now, our first point just has to be the providence of God. Let us go back to Judges chapter 13. We see right here that the angel comes to Manoah's wife. In the town of Zorah. Now, Zorah is kind of a cool name because Zorah, that little town, means hornet. So, if you know your Bible, you know that the hornet of God would always go in front of his people. And so, Samson was born in the town of the hornet. And his mom is confronted by an angel. He says, you are childless and sterile, but God is going to allow you to have a son. But here's the thing. This son is going to be a Nazarite from birth so that he will know that he is God's man. Now, if you check back in Numbers chapter 6, you find all the ordinances about becoming a Nazarite. Now, Nazarite simply means, in Hebrew, set apart. They were to have no wine, no grapes, not even raisins. They could not touch a dead human body and no razor could touch their head. And get this. Men and women could become Nazarites. And so we find right here, actually, the first woman Nazarite that's recorded is Samson's mom. She doesn't have any fermented drink. She takes the vow during her pregnancy to be a Nazarite. And so most Nazarites are just for a few days or a few weeks. But we find in Samson what's called the first perpetual Nazarite. And, of course, the other one that we read about is John the Baptist. And so we read this in chapter 13, in verse 24. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him while he was in Mananadam between Zorah and Estol. You know, the name Samson's an interesting one. It means the sun. Why would she name him the sun? Well, the sun is bright. It's the sun that gives hope, does it not? And so she named him Samson, like the sun. For you will bring light to the darkness of the people of God. You know, it's so exciting to see how God has a plan and a purpose for each life. It's so exciting to see how God orchestrates the nations, orchestrates individuals in order for people to come to Christ. Turn to Acts chapter 17. Come on, yeah. Good one. 
In Acts 17, Paul says in verse 26, From one man he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them, and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him, and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. God says that God appoints the exact time and the exact places that we should live. Why? So that we would seek him, reach out for him, and find him. And you were wondering why you were invited to church today. So you said it was your friend that invited you, your co-worker, your fellow student. No, 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 no. God has been orchestrating this moment because he's put you the exact place, the exact time. And now you have a choice on whether to reach out and seek him and find him. You know, one of the most exciting things for all of us that came down from the mission team in Portland is to be able to come down to L.A. making all the sacrifices that we did. You know, it is exciting to sacrifice for God. Amen, guys? And perhaps no other family sacrificed as much as Nick and Denise Bordieri. I mean, Nick worked for Nike for 20 years. And he gave that all up to move down here to Los Angeles to be on the mission team and be one of the shepherding couples. Now, it was a challenge because he had his own house that he owned and he was trying to flip another house. And if you haven't noticed, the housing market hasn't been going real well lately. Well, it it still hasn't been going real well out there. But nevertheless, they decided to leave Portland and to come to a land that they did not know. And he didn't have a job, but God found him a job at Under Armour. There at Under Armour, he met another incredible man named Russ Bevins. Now, Russ is the head of design at Under Armour. And of course, they got to meet each other. Russ came to church, and then both of them had to go to China for three weeks. And you know, there's not a heck of a lot to do over in China except study your Bible when you're with a Christian. You know what I'm talking about right there? And so they came on back. Russ has been studying all this week. And today, Russ is going to be baptized into Christ. Set fire you on up. You know, the providence of God is really so amazing. I mean, it it was awesome. Just a a few weeks ago, the Zindler family was planning to come on out to... uh, Los Angeles, they said, listen, we need to get to be with a church and with a fellowship that's on fire for God. And so Ken made all these plans. He asked me, hey, could you send out one of the young men like Vic Jr. to help drive uh, my son on out and to help me pack the U-Haul? Well, Vic went on out. And you know how sometimes delays get us ticked off? Well, he got into Gainesville, Florida at about 3 in the morning, three hours late. And Ken said, hey, no way you're going to be taken off this morning with so little sleep. And besides that, mm, I blew it. I got the wrong size U-Haul. I had a little bit more than I thought I had. You know, that could happen to any of us. And so he had already loaded up the little U-Haul, and he had to unload the little U-Haul and put it into the big (laughs) U-Haul. Well, in the meantime, so he made Vic Jr. stay around, and they called up some friends, and one of the friends they called on up was a young man that had been raised in the church named Gabe Morello. Well, Ken, being being the the kind of guy that he is, took took them all out to this barbecue place to kind of celebrate that night and to thank everybody for packing up the big U-Haul. In the midst of it, Vic Jr. is talking to uh, this this young man, Gabe, and uh, he says, hey, man. How come uh, you got that tattoo on you right there? It says promise. He says, oh, man, you had to ask. He says, well, well, a bunch of us in the team ministry, we, got, we all got tattoos that said promise. And we promised that if any one of us fell away, we'd go after him no matter what it took. And Vic goes, well, how many are faithful? None. Then Vic goes, you better do something about it, Gabe. You could be the promise. I tell you what, Gabe. How about you come with us tonight and and go out to Los Angeles? (laughs) Well, when are you leaving? Well, in about five hours. Come and find your God again. Well, Gabe came. 
He studied the Bible. He saw that when he got baptized at 11 or 12, he was just getting wet. You know how that, that happens sometimes. And just a few days ago, he got baptized into Christ. Is that awesome? And now, and now he's going to fulfill that promise. Are you with me right here, guys? You see, God orchestrates the exact times and places that we're at. And we may get ticked off that our plane is three hours late. We may get ticked off that we have a little bit too much materialism junk. But on the other hand, God uses everything for his glory to bring people to Jesus Christ. Are you with me right here? Second point. An unrealized potential. Unrealized potential. Potential. Let's go to Judges, chapters 14 and 15. And we're going to go through this very quickly to be able to kind of capture what Samson's character is like. God judges character by a person's deeds, not by his words. He looks at his deeds and he says, this is what your character is all about. But the exciting thing I think you'll just see is that God works through us and many times in spite of us and even through our own sins in order for his will to be done. Let's get going. Chapter 14. Samson, the son, the hope of Israel. Verse 1. Samson went down to Timnah, and there he saw a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman amongst your relatives, amongst all of our people? Must you go, the uncircumcised Philistines, to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling Israel. Let's stop right here. Right here, we find that Samson compromises the word of God. In Joshua chapter 23 and verse 12, Joshua in his final speech lays it out. You must not intermarry. With the people outside of Israel. We find that this was passed on down even to the kings. And so we read in Nehemiah chapter 13 these words about intermarriage with people not of faith. Nehemiah is trying to lead a restoration movement. And he says this about intermarriage in verse 25 of chapter 13. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to let their daughters marriage for your sons or yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you two are doing all this same terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? When we date outside the kingdom, when we marry outside of the kingdom, we sin. We become unfaithful to God. And yet at this time in the history of Israel, convictions had waned. And people were saying, it's okay. It's okay to intermarry with outside people. See, a lot of people get hung up on the fewness of the scriptures in the New Testament about not being yoked to unbelievers. But the problem is they only look at the New Testament. You look in the Old Testament and book after book after book talks about that intermarriage is a sin that is unfaithfulness to God. See, that's why at the congregation here, we're not just a New Testament church. We're a Bible church. We believe in the whole Bible. Are you with me here, church? Now, So what was his first sin right here? It was compromise. Compromise because of a pretty face. He compromises the word of God. Let's keep reading. Verse 5. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they were approaching the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring towards him. The spirit of the Lord came upon him in power, so he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. Can you imagine this? You're walking, you're just walking on down to Timnah, and all of a sudden, dude, just, just, this young lion comes on out. And then the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson. You know, and a lot of people have Samson looking like really bulky and, you know, like muscular, like he's on steroids. 
But you know, there's no indication of that. It just says that he was incredibly strong. In fact, he could look like DJ and the Holy Spirit come down on him. I mean, picture this. See, this guy looks like DJ. And he sees this line comes to him. He says, okay. You know, a lot of us, a lot of us have trouble ripping apart a dead chicken. Just trying to get this going. We have trouble dislodging the, the wing from the thigh. And then, in the analogy right here, it says, he tore the line apart as he might have a young goat. Now, when was the last time he tore apart a young goat? A live young goat. I mean, blood squirting out, and you pull on this sin. He takes on a cotton picking lion. He goes, okay. Boom. And didn't bother telling anybody about it. But you know, at this point, because of his long hair and because of taking out this lion, Samson knew he was the anointed of God. He was the hope of Israel. And so right here we find incredible strength. Verse 8. Sometime later he went back to marry her. He turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. And it was a swarm of bees and some honey which he scooped out with his hand and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and and they too ate it. But he didn't tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Now his father went down to see the woman, and Samson made a feast there, as was customary for bridegrooms. When he appeared, he was given 30 companions. Well, now these 30 companions would have been Philistines, right? Verse 12. Let me tell you a riddle. Oh. So you see, Samson's not this dumb, brawny guy. He's a bright, clever person. He says, let me tell you this riddle. Now you're going to find there's a dash of arrogance here. Samson said to them, if you can give me the answer within seven days of the feast, I'll give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. He replied, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. For three days, they couldn't give the answer. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, Coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to rob us? Now, right here, his wife has a choice. Do I love my husband? Or do I love my world? To the point of death. Well, let's see what she does. Verse 16. Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, You hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. Let's see, which way did she go? Samson goes, I haven't even explained to my father. My mother replied, so why should I explain to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her, because she continued to press him, she in turn explained the riddle to her people. Before the sun set on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? Samson said to them, If you had not plowed my heifer, you had not solved my riddle. <laughs> now, I don't think this gives you the biblical right to call your wife a heifer. I just... <laughs> I offer that only as a suggestion. Only a suggestion. Verse 19, then the spirit of the Lord came on him in power. He went down to Ascalon. Okay, now you see where Ascalon is? On your map right here? He goes down to Ascalon, the heart of Philistine territory. Struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of their belongings, and gave their clothes to those who explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he went to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to a friend who attended him at the wedding. Wow. He goes down into the heart of Philistine territory. See, the Philistines owned pretty much all of this side of Judah and on into Dan, and we're starting to come into Ephraim. So he just goes from his wedding feast and just goes all the way down to Aslan, one of the main cities, and he picks out 30 guys. Hey, you, 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 you. Takes his clothes. Okay. Okay, guys, here's the 30 garments I promised. From this, we see that he was quick to action. 
He was decisive. And it's very interesting to find a decisive man who also had a problem with sentimentality. Because that's his problem with his wife. He wouldn't take a stand. He gave in to sentimentality. Let's read on, chapter 15. Later on, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. Oh, wow. This is amazing. He's going to see his wife because he wants to forgive her. And he wanted, and the way he wasn't going to take flowers, he was taking a young goat. Again, once more, probably not the thing to do these days. But I think the idea works. And so we find another incredible quality. Here is this man that has an anger issue, but he also is an incredibly forgiving person. I mean, his wife's treachery was incredible. And then he goes, okay, I'll, I'll make up. I'll get her a goat. He said, verse 1, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father wouldn't let him go in. I was so sure you thoroughly hated her because of the treachery, he said, that I gave her to your friend. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Samson said to them, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened the torch to each pair of tails. He lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks in the standing grain together with the vineyards and olive and groves. Wow. Now, first of all, have you ever caught a fox? <laughs> they are fast. So not only was he super strong, but he was fast. Faster than a fox. And he grabbed 300 of these little critters. And we also now find something else about him. He's very imaginative. <laughs> he could have, he could have just shh, lit the grain fields on fire, which would have spread to the olive groves and so on. He goes, no, I'm tying up these little critters, tail to tail, making 150 pairs. I'm sticking a torch right in the middle of that knot. And then I'm going to let them go. And you can imagine these little scared little foxes. They want to see 150 pairs going to the fields, going like crazy, you know. The Philistines are going, oh, my God, what is happening? Verse 6. When the Philistines asked, who did it? They're told, Samson, the Timonite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his friend. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. She got the very punishment that she was afraid she was going to get. Because of her treachery and not standing by her husband. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Etam. Now Etam is in the middle of Simeon. So now he's basically in the middle of nowhere. That's, that's where you go when you're really discouraged. A cave in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes it's front of a TV set. Wives, you know how it is when you try to get your husband out of the cave. Are you with me right here? Well, that's where Samson went. Verse 9. The Philistines went up and camped in Judah, spreading out near Lehi. The men of Judah asked, Why have you come to fight us? We have come to take Samson prisoner, they asked, to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Don't you realize the Philistines are rulers over us? Why have you done this to us? Now hold it. These are the cotton-picking, enemy, uncircumcised Philistines. And they're going to their hero. Say, what have you done? Don't you see the number of Philistines that are out there? Now, the number of people that came to Samson wasn't just a few. There were 3,000 brothers from Judah. 3,000 guys that said, Samson, you are wrong to attack these Philistines. Can't you live in peace? Look what happens. He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, We've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, Swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed. They answered, We will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lahai, the Philistines came toward him shouting. So he see these people shouting. 
The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arm became like sharp flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Now that's cranking. He's there. All these Philistines are coming to him shouting. And then he feels the power of the Lord. He looks down. He just grabs, breaks the ropes. Looks around. Sees a fresh donkey jawbone. Ray gets it. He says, okay, come on. And the Bible says he takes out a thousand. You talk about mortal combat. <laughs> this guy moved faster than any video game. Bible's much more exciting than video games. And of course, when you read this passage, we all remember Joshua 23.10, do we not? When Joshua said, and one of you will rout a thousand, Samson becomes the fulfillment of that prophecy. Can you imagine taking out a thousand guys with a cotton pick and jawbone? In celebration, Samson writes a song. <laughs> Verse 16. Then Samson said, With a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. Amen. I love that verse. Let's sing it again. <laughs> With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. When he finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was called Ramoth Lehi. That means jawbone hill. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, You've given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall in the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place in the high, and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he revived. So the spring was called in Hakkahori, and it's still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of Philistines. Wow. He was a man of great prayer. But what have we found out about Samson? Well, he had unparalleled strength. He was bright. He was clever. He was decisive. He was forgiving. He was imaginative. He was courageous. He took on a thousand Philistines by himself. Not one brother from Judah took a stand by him. He says, I'm going to live by my convictions. If you guys want to be wimps with the Philistines, then let it be. Just give me a jawbone and let's go at it. And then he was just so whooped. And I'm telling you, you know, if you've ever whooped a, a thousand Philistines with a fresh donkey jawbone, you're whooped. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it really just takes a lot out of you. He almost dies. And, he's, and, and, and it shows he's a man of prayer. He goes, God, give me water. And God miraculously gives him water and revives him. What an incredible guy. A great man of prayer. And yet, we find during this same period, his life compromised the word of God, particularly with women. There was arrogance. He was sentimental. He had an anger issue. And he was full of bitterness. What happened then is he has a bunch of mixed motivations. I want to do this for God and deal with these uncircumcised Philistines because I'm the anointed of God. There's such hate and anger. And because of mixed motivations, he failed to realize his potential. Why? He was all alone. Turn to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, verse 28. Paul writes, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all the energy which so powerfully works in me. Some people have wrongly used this as an evangelism verse. It's not. It's a discipling verse. We proclaim Christ to our fellow brothers and sisters by admonishing and teaching them. Why? So we may present everyone mature in Christ. Now, yes, you have to have your own convictions to be mature. You have to distinguish right from wrong, Hebrews chapter 5. But on the other hand, the Bible says you also can't be mature unless you got other people in your life. See, there was no one in Samson's life. Now, you got to admire that he was all alone and he had these incredible convictions. But when you're all alone and you're isolated, 
these sins of your flesh come to neutralize all the good things that you want to do for God. And so you have an unrealized potential. You know, for a lot of people, it's been a long time since they've been discipled. I remember when Luis had just joined our fellowship and he got challenged on a certain issue. He goes, whoa, baby. That's the first time I've been discipled about four or five years. Whoa. You know, people have gotten away from discipling. And as the book of Jeremiah says, and my people love it this way. You know, I, I'm so proud of Lou, Jack, and Kathy. We've, we've gotten in some great discussions. They've been totally transparent with their lives, and we've been totally transparent with our lives. And you know what I'm, I'm so fired up about is <laughs> Luis, every week, He's just, he's just bounding with energy. I mean, he goes up to Bakersfield. He goes out to Palm Springs. I mean, he's just cranking. In the midst of that, he's got financial challenges. <laughs> and, and, and almost about every two or three days, he's going, Bro, I just feel so strong. Bro, I feel so, it's so great to have my purpose back. I am so fired up for God. But if you would have seen Luis and Kathy come on in the very first day they visited us, that was not the scene you would have seen. They came crawling on in with a little distance between him because they had had a bump the night before. That's a fight, bottom line. (laughs) But you know, when you get in there, you can can disciple out compromise. You can disciple out arrogance. You can disciple out sentimentality. You can disciple out anger. You can disciple out bitterness because we believe that people can change. Doesn't matter how old they are. We believe that people can change. But what is the fundamental? It's humility. You must be humble before God. And you must be humble before men to be discipled. One brother I appreciate a lot is Marty Wooten. And uh, many of you don't know this, but uh, Marty has a Ph.D. in ministry. That means he studied the Bible a little bit. And... uh, it's kind of interesting. We had D time yesterday, and he, we're sitting down, and Marty and I got healthy jamba juices, and Kathy and Lena got these coffee things. And we just sit down, we're just talking a little bit, and this Marty goes, kind of acting gruff, kind of acting like ticked off. He goes, Are you going to make me take first principles? I took a sip of the jamba. I said, yes, brother. I think it would be good for you, and plus, we need your help. He goes, oh, bro, I was just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm going to take it because Gordo needs a lot of help. Now, when you start getting that humble... When you get a PhD in whatever you think you're so smart in. And then you get humble and say, I'm going to do first principles. I'm going to change my schedule. Because God and his kingdom comes before anything else. And we've got to have that kind of conviction. I doubt whether Marty's going to learn a whole lot in first principles. But he, he, he wants to come to encourage the brothers that have a difficult time memorizing. He wants to set an example for those that maybe have taken it ten times like himself. Because it's all about working together and being humble before the Lord so the Lord can pull us together to build a ministry where everyone is a sold-out disciple so that we can go out from this place and evangelize the world in this generation. Are you with me right here? See, bottom line, without discipling, you're going to have unrealized Potential. Point three. Restless lust. You know the first part about that. That was in chapter 14, verse 3, when you saw that pretty Philistine girl. Yeah, non-Christians can be pretty. But they're even prettier after they get baptized. Amen? Chapter 16, verse 1. 
One day, Samson went to Gaza. Uh Uh-oh, where's Gaza? Oh, baby. It's in the heart of Philistine territory. Wow. One day, Samson went to Gaza. Now, you remember, he's the enemy of the Philistines. He's just walking along. I can go to Gaza today. It's cracking. One day, Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson's here. Everybody knew Samson. He's like a superstar. So they surrounded the place and lay away for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with his two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his soldier and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now, a lot of people, they don't understand what went on right here. They just thought, well, Samson just got, felt like he needed a little workout, so he gets up in the middle of the night, so he escapes being killed, and he just literally takes out the city gates there in one of the capitals in Gaza, and, and he takes them to the top of the hill and faces it toward Hebron, you know, the city of God. Well, there's much more to it right here, and you start to see that Samson did have spirituality. You see, the Philistine god Dagon, was reported to supposedly guard any gate that no one could oppose Dagon at the gate. He would keep the Philistine city safe. And so Samson goes, I'm taking out Dagon, baby. He just takes the gate. I'll show you who's boss here and puts it down top of the hill. So now we see who's really God, Jehovah or Dagon. Now the sad part here, Of course, this is time with the prostitute. And when you look at all that was going on, even in the time of Eli, and Eli's sons were were lying with women in front of the temple of God. That's how bad it had become in Israel. And you know, I mean, we live in such a godless world. We were coming back from our first dinner with the Bryants a couple of weeks ago. And we're coming into Beverly Hills. This is Beverly Hills. And they had this giant, giant, giant sign that said, life is short, have an affair. It's by an escort service. That is how brazen the world is. It's so in your face. You look at the TV. I mean, it's nothing what's going on. We just take it for granted, the immorality, premarital sex. It's just screwed over that TV. The dress or the lack of dress. I mean, lust is accepted. Pornography is rampant on the Internet. We find that people are just in sin and secrecy in their masturbation. Immorality is so prevalent. Adultery is prevalent. Homosexuality has become cool in some parts of society. Turn to Ephesians 5. Paul says in verse 3, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, of course, joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, nor a moral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Paul flat lays it out. You know, guys, we we just need to deal with this thing right here. He says, you got greed in your life. You're not going to heaven. And there are a lot of people that have no longer discipling relationships. There's a lot of people that have left the Lord, that have left the church, and their life is all about money, how much you can have. Say, so how do I know? Because when they try to come back to church, their life is so full, they have trouble even making Wednesday night. That becomes a challenge. Wow. That's only two hours. We're supposed to be disciples 24-7. Secondly, he says right here, he says, yeah, you can't even have any immorality. That's idolatry. But the impurity. Now, impurity, guys, let's break it down. Impurity includes pornography and masturbation. If you're into that kind of garbage, you're not going to go to heaven unless you repent. And for a lot of people, it's secret sin that has been undealt with for years. See, we've got to have a deep conviction that we need to be transparent. There ain't anybody perfect in this congregation. That person is not a member. So 
If you decide to get baptized or place membership, you're not going to wreck up our church. <laughs> but what we do call people to do, because Jesus, is you've got to live a transparent life. You've got to get open and get real and start dealing with your life. And be willing to have humility that says, okay, I'm going to listen to the word of God. And I'm going to listen to my brothers and sisters in Christ who are out for God's and my best interest. Now, we need to have our own convictions. And we don't do things because that church does it or that person does it. But if someone shows you the scriptures, that is the word of God that's calling you to that life. Amen, church? Let's get back to chapter 16. In chapter 16, beginning in verse 4. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Oh, boy. The valley of Sorek. Now, you find Sorek on your, on your map, right? It's a, the border between Judah and Dan. It's a Sorek river. It's a Sorek valley. Sorek means vineyard. No Nazarite needs to be around the vineyard. And when you go to the wrong places, you're going to meet the wrong faces. And he had no business being in the vineyard. And then he meets this woman, Delilah. Now, a lot of people think that she's a Philistine. I absolutely do not think so. You'll see from the text that's come, it, it, it seems like the Philistines are not a part of her. It says the Philistine rulers come to her. Oh, Samson, the Philistines, you don't talk that way about your own people. There's only two possibilities. Number one, she could have been a sacred prostitute or a courtesan from another nation. Say what? Because of her name. Delilah is a play on words that, that simply means night. In other words, the idea, so she took on, like some prostitutes do, the name night. The idea of being flirtatious. She might have been someone that, that worshipped a sexual goddess. But I think that she most likely was simply a fallen away Israelite that didn't know God. She was simply a fallen away Israelite that didn't know God. And so we find that Samson, the son, the hope of Israel, now meets the night and the darkness. And the darkness covers the sun. Verse 5. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and, and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. That'll do anyone for life. He says, We will give you enough money to take care of you the rest of your life. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Samson answered, If anyone ties me to seven fresh thongs that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. Then the rulers of the Philistines brought her seven fresh thongs that had not been dried, and she tied them with him. With men hidden in the room, she called him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the thongs as easily as a piece of string snaps it when it comes to a flame. So the secret of strength was not discovered. Then Delilah said, Samson, You made a fool of me. You lied to me. Come now. Tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied them with them. Then the men hidden in the room, with men hidden in the room, she called them, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threads. Delilah then said to Samson, until now you've been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. He replied, if you weave the seven braids of my head in the fabric on the loom and tighten it with a pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. So while he was sleeping, Delilah took seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened them with the pin. Again, she called him, Samson, the Philistines upon you. He awoke from his sleep, pulled up the pin and the loom with the fabric. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you made a fool of me and you haven't told me the secret of your great street. With such nagging. She prodded him day after day until he was tired to death. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I've been given a Nazarite set apart from God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. 
When Delilah saw he told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, Come back once more. He's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of her head. And so began to subdue him. And his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gorged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. And they sent him to grinding in the prison. You know, right here, we find the restless lust of Samson, his ultimate undoing. And yet we also find the evil that can be in the heart of women. The use of flirting. The use of sexual favors. The passion for money. The passion for comfort, a house, and things. The way they get their way is to nag. Now, we know that she was faking it. So she, under, she, she totally understood that nagging breaks a man down. Now, a lot of sisters, they, they, they don't really understand it, but they kind of do because it works a lot of the time. And that way they get their way. They just don't understand the level of bitterness they produce. Day after day after day of nagging. And he grew tired to death. Right here, there are many lessons to learn. But the saddest words of Scripture when his hair was cut off is he did not know that the Lord had left him. Words that echo from the church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. They have a reputation of being alive, but they are dead. See, sometimes we think the Lord is still with us. And our hearts are full of evil. Our deeds are full of evil. And we have no idea that the Spirit is up. There are some people even going to church and the Spirit has left their life. How do you know? Look at their life. Look at their deeds. Many have the reputation of being a great disciple. But they're dead. The Spirit's been gone a long time. The lights were turned off long ago. The sun had set and night reigned. You know, there's a uh, musical that I love called Les Mis. And the first part of Les Mis, there's this woman whose dreams of love are totally dashed. And she sings a song entitled, I Dreamed a Dream. It goes, There was a time when men were kind. When their voices were soft and their words inviting. There was a time when love was blind and the world was a song. And the song was exciting. There was a time when it all went wrong. I dreamed a dream in time gone by. When hope was high and life worth living. I dreamed that love would never die. I dreamed that God would be forgiving. Then I was young and unafraid. And dreams were made and used and wasted. There was no ransom to be paid. No song unsung. No wine untasted. But the tigers come at night with their voices soft as thunder as they tear your hope apart, as they turn your dream to shame. But there are dreams that cannot be, and there are storms we cannot weather. I had a dream my life would be so different from this hell I'm living, so different now from what it seemed. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. I don't know if you've ever been there. I have. There's a time in my life, about five years ago, that I lost the dream. That my life was hell. And you know, in the midst of all that, I believe that God is sovereign. Everything that happens, God either makes happen or allows it to happen. Even the sins that are committed against us. For me, my arrogance and not taking care of the weak were gross sins that the Lord opposed. And yet in the midst of this, I, I, had, I had to break out. There's just something inside that says, no, 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 I want my dream back. I had to figure out some stuff. Number one, when the movement crashed, my faith in God crashed. And I had to separate God from the movement. 
And understand that God is as awesome as I ever thought he was. And the movement, eh, it's filled with people like me and Marty. I had to separate being a disciple from being a leader. I became a disciple at 17 years old, and just like the song says, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Leadership, that just comes if you're a faithful disciple. I was made very weak by God. There were things said to me and my wife and my family that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemies. And you, know, you say these things and you, and you go, oh man, just give me a little grace, a little mercy. And in your mind you're going, I will never treat anybody like this again. <laughs> and God showed me what it was like to be weak. And how compassion was so necessary to bring the weak back to him. You see, I dreamed a dream. And that dream was killed. And yet the only way back is not blaming all the people around you that you feel have wronged you. It's repenting of your own sins. Your own anger, your own bitterness, your own shortcomings. And bottom line, self-pity that says, I want to quit. And you go, I'm not quitting. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Our last point, an ending legacy. I love verse 22. This is right after they seize him. This, is, this, this just gives you a shiver. Chapter 16, verse 22. But the hair on Samson's head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now, doesn't that pump you up right there? Nick, doesn't that pump? Oh, no. Okay, okay. Verse 23. Verse 23. Let's move on. Let's not get distracted. Now, the rulers of Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste to our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson, entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. They, they, they made him dance in front of them. This, this superhero guy, they're mocking. When they stood him amongst the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, Put me where I can fill the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Most likely, they thought he was just tired out from the mockery and the dancing. He's just leaning against the pillars. Remember, he's blinded now. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord. O oh, sovereign Lord, remember me. Oh God, please strengthen me just once more. And let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistine for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood. Bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left on the other, Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all of his might. And down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than while. He lived. You know, his hair had grown back. But he still didn't have his strength. That's why he prayed, God, give me the strength to take out this temple. See, all along he thought it was his hair. And he didn't understand it was his dedication to God. And he finally figured it. Why? Because he finally hit bottom. Now, let me tell you something. Until you hit bottom, you're not going to really deal with your life. There are a lot of people just playing disciple these days. That's why we talk about being a sold-out disciple. That means something. Samson hit bottom. And you know something? Last week we studied about a great hero, Jephthah. Jephthah was only judged for six years and with all the grief of his brothers turning on him, having to kill his daughter, being the son of a prostitute, all this grief finally just took him out. And I believe that basically Jephthah died of a broken heart. But Samson didn't. Oh, he was just as devastated, just as full of grief. But he understood. He understood. That his strength came from.
from God. And so here is this man, blinded and hearing only laughter, sensing that his life has brought shame upon his God and God's people. And he says, lean me against the pillar. And he says, God, one more time, just once more, give me that strength. And he takes out those pillars. The rulers of the Philistines die. A blow for God. 3,000 enemies of God die. A blow for God. And you see, at the end of his life, he turned to God his strength and he brought the house down. <laughs> I was talking to Ken Zindler. And uh, Ken says, you know, bro, I'm getting up there. I'm getting a lot older. He says, but you know something? I, I've just determined I'm going to go out swinging. I want the guns a blazing. Just like Samson. Bring the house down. You know, Ken Zindler isn't just saying that. You know, Ken, I believe, was baptized in Gainesville, and at one point, he was leading three Bible talks as a young person there. And then he started hooking up with these disciples up in Boston. He started communicating with them and getting behind their world vision. And when the leadership of that church in Gainesville found out that he, 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 he really loved what we were doing and even was considering moving up there, they took away all of his leadership. And then he moved to Boston. In Boston, I mean, the Lord blessed him. But when he sought the hand of this beautiful, fair maiden, Liliana, he went to seek advice. And the person told him, She's too good for you. <laughs> now, I happen to believe that person was right, but still, Lord bless them and, you know, all that. In Boston, he became a full-time preacher for the Lord. Then the Holy Spirit took him to Orlando, and he's a full-time preacher for the Lord. And then all the stuff happened, and they fired him for preaching the word too hard. And he still didn't lose it. He looked around and he, and he heard about this church in Florida that had a reputation for being with it. So he moved his family up there. He couldn't be in the ministry, so he became a, a football coach and he taught high school. And had some success there. But when the church there was just a reputation for being alive, he began to look towards Portland and City of Angels. And he said, listen. I got to do whatever it takes to be with a group of sold out disciples. And so that's when he decided to leave everything he was and everything he did in order to find this kind of a fellowship. And he's brought his family here with the hope of getting everybody to heaven. And you know, he doesn't just talk about living the life, he does it. About a year ago, he and Liliana were so excited about the work in Santiago, Chile, because at that time, Elena and I were discipling the Moreños, and things were cranking. And he and his wife decided to set apart $15,000 just to give it to Santiago. Well, then in the fall, Raul cut off our relationship because we talked about that we're going to start a new movement. Just totally cut off. And Ken goes, oh, no, I've dedicated the money to Santiago. Well, anyway, he kind of held on to the money, knowing he needed to give it. So anyway, we got together this summer, and he says, bro, talk me out of this. But I, I gave my word I was going to give the money to Santiago. And, I, and right now it seems like they're opposed in the direction that you guys are going. I said, well, bro, I think you need to get the money. He says, well, why is that? I said, Raul's just called. And he says he's going to be joining us again. <laughs> and by the way, he'll get fired. So we could use your $15,000 right about September 1. And the Zindlers gave that money just a few days ago. Is that awesome? Let me tell you something. God is orchestrating the nations. He takes this kid and Dan whose mom could not have a child and they say, your name will be Samson. He takes an evil judge named Eli and Ephraim and allows him to train the greatest of all the judges, Samuel. At the same time, in a little town of Bethlehem, 
This is kid Jesse growing up who someday would have a big family and his youngest being King David. Here at this time, God is orchestrating the nations, be it Santiago, be it Los Angeles, be it Orlando, be it wherever. Our God is moving. What was Samson's ending legacy? He took the house down. What's the challenge this morning? It's very simple. Number one, P, the providence of God. Number two, unrealized potential, U. Number three, restless lust, R. Number four, an ending legacy, E, pure. When you are pure before the Lord, when your motives are not mixed and you do everything for God and it's all about God, That at the end of your life, you realize your strength lies in nothing that you are, nothing that you have, nothing that you've done. Your strength is in God. And you'll bring the house down too. Thanks and God bless.